Welcome back. We're talking about stochastic gradient descent. This is a setting where, as always, we want to minimize a convex function, except we're not going to use gradients. We're going to use noisy versions of these. So in other words, instead of using something like gradient of f of x or an element of the subdifferential of f at x, instead, we're going to be using something which I denote as g tilde to remind us that it's a random variable. And the property that g tilde has, the key property, is that the expected value over any randomness there is there of g tilde x is, in fact, an element of the subdifferential. If our function is differentiable, that means that the, expected, the expectation of g tilde must equal the gradient of the function at that point. So this, uh, this lecture is about the good news. And the good news is that stochastic gradient descent, even though, as we saw in the previous lecture, there is a role of variance here, stochastic gradient descent does, in fact, converge. So here is the main statement of this result. Again, I sometimes don't write, don't repeat the fact that f is convex and our constraint sign is convex, because everything we're talking about, unless I specifically mention otherwise, F is, f is going to be convex. So uh, the result says the following. Let's suppose that, and again, this is the only thing I'm, gonna, I'm going to assume. Um, suppose that, of course, I'm assuming that an optimal solution, it doesn't have to be unique, uh, exists. So I'm not trying to minimize something that goes off to minus infinity. And I'm going to assume that there is an upper bound on the variance of my stochastic gradients. So in other words, what I'm going to write is that the expected value of g tilde x squared is bounded above. I'm going to use capital G here to bound it. So you should compare this to what we had before in the setting for subgrading descent, we had something very similar. So compare to our assumptions for subgrading descent, you'll recall that we needed our function f to be Lipschitz, which was equivalent to just asking that gx squared is bounded above by some constant. So things are very similar here. I'm just asking that in expectation, this is, uh, that this is the case. So the main result says that as, as long as this is the case, if we use the SGD algorithm, which is exactly like subgradient descent, except instead of a subgradient, sub sub it uses the stochastic gradient, xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus my step size times g tilde of x. Then, what did we have for subgradient? We had that f of 1 over t times the sum of xt. We had a bound on the suboptimality of this. Well, this is going to be exactly the same, except that our bound will hold an expectation. And this makes sense just because there's randomness. So if there's randomness, we need to make sure that our results, uh, our results can't hold, uh, won't hold typically with, with, with probability one, but it holds an expectation. So this is bounded above by r times g divided by square root of t, where r again is something that we've seen before. r is equal to, it's just some upper bound on how far away we initialize. So this is very similar. So the right-hand side essentially looks exactly like what we had before. And an observation here is that it doesn't seem to hurt us at all that we're using stochastic gradient descent. And this is one of the remarkable properties. Again, we see that we have this convergence rate is 1 over square root of t. This is exactly what we saw before. So let's see how this, uh, how this proof works. 
We're going to just look at one step of the proof, and, and that, will be, that will be enough. So we get expected value of xt plus 1 minus x star. And if you look back at the proof of subgrading descent, you'll see that this is essentially the same. It's actually would be instructive for you to look back and see what's, what's different here. Where, where does the randomness uh, play a role in terms of our analysis of this algorithm? So I want to bound this. When I mention that I'm looking at just one step initially of the algorithm, I mean I'm looking at what happens from xt to xt plus 1. So in the context of this expectation here, that means that I'm going to look at, I'm going to condition on xt. Now the reason that I want to do this, the technical reason I want to do this, is that even the, sub the, sub the stochastic gradient that I get at time t plus 1, this is a function of where I am, which is a function of all of the past randomness. So in order to just look at one step, I I'm going to condition on xt, condition on where I am. So I'm conditioning on the realization of all of the past, all the past randomness. We're then going to use the tower rule to get a, a, a result for, for the entire trajectory. OK, so just like we did for the proof of subgrading descent, let's write out what xt plus 1 is. So this is the expected value of xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus my step size times my stochastic gradient. That's the g tilde. I'll just write g tilde of t instead of x sub t uh, minus x star. Again, here's my conditioning on xt. Now, again, as we've done in all of the proofs, I'm now going to multiply that this quadratic. So this is equal to the expectation of grouping the first and the third terms, xt minus x star squared minus twice the cross term, 2 eta times gt tilde times xt minus x star plus the, the middle term squared. And that's eta squared times the norm of gt tilde squared. All of this conditioned on xt. OK, so now let's look what this, uh, what this conditioning does for me. So the expected value of a sum is a sum of the expectations. So this first term is going to be xt minus x star. There's no more randomness in here because I've conditioned on xt. g tilde is still random. But what's happened here? In this first step here, g tilde is inside a norm squared. So I can't pass the expectation directly to that. But in this case, in the second line, g tilde just appears linearly. So that means that I can write this as minus 2 eta times the expected value of g tilde t transpose times xt minus x star. You see what the conditioning does for me. And by our very assumption, this has to equal an actual element of the subdifferential, which I'll just write as gt without the tilde, plus eta squared times the expected value of gt tilde squared conditioned on xt. Now let's see where we are. So let's, let's, look at this, uh, let's look at this middle term. This is just an actual subgradient, gt, times xt minus x star. Well, now we can use convexity. So this is, this is the kind of quantity that we've seen many times before. We're, we're quite used to seeing this. And so what we get is that this is xt minus x star, no change in the first term. And then the second term, I'm, I'm bounding by f of xt minus f of x star. I mean, this is just our, 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 our basic uh, inequality that we get from convexity. And then the third term is the same. So this looks very similar to what we have in our usual analysis. So now, 
what we're going to do is use the tower rule for conditional expectation. And what this gets me, we're using the tower rule for conditional expectation. I get what was on the left-hand side, but now in expectation. So the expected value of xt plus 1 minus x star. Note that I'm not conditioning on anything anymore. This is less than or equal to the expected value of xt minus x star squared minus 2 eta times, I had f of xt minus f of x star, but f of xt was not a random variable only when we condition on xt. Now we're not conditioning anymore, so I have the expectation of f of xt minus f of x star. x star is, is deterministic, so f of x star has no randomness in it. Plus eta squared times the expected value of g tilde t squared. This expectation I know is upper bounded by g squared, this last expectation. So uh, using that, this is in turn less than or equal to the expected value of xt minus x star squared minus 2 eta times the expected value of f of xt minus f of x star plus eta squared g squared. That's my upper bound so far. Well, that means I've gotten an upper bound on xt plus 1 minus x star, upper bounded by xt minus x star minus something. So I can just repeat it. And so xt minus x star is upper bounded by xt minus 1 minus x star plus something. And I can continue in, 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 in exactly this way. And so this, in turn, is going to be less than or equal to, basically repeating, just iterating this. This will be less than or equal to expected value of x1 minus x star squared minus 2 eta. Now I have to add up all of the terms, all of these extra terms that I got. I'm basically just summing this. So what are the extra terms that I got? Here I had expected value of xt minus f of x star. I'm going to add to that expected value of xt minus 1 minus f of x star, etc. So I'm just summing these over t. Another way you can think about this, rather than thinking about just iterating this, this, this recursion, is I could bring x, I could bring, uh, I could bring this term over here over onto the left-hand side, over to here, and then I would have a telescoping sum, and then I could just sum the left and the right, and I would essentially get the same thing. This is, this is, this is, these two things are, are, are exactly equivalent. So I have here the sum from k equals 1 to t, expected value of f of xk minus f of x star, plus just t times eta squared g squared. Why t? That's how many times I'm adding it up. There's no index of summation here, so it's just, it's just t times that. So what does this... Uh, what does, this, uh, what does this promise me? I'm going to bring this term over onto the left. I find that 2 eta times the sum from k equals 1 to t of expected value of f of xk minus f of x star is upper bounded by this term here, which is equal to r squared, which is upper bounded by r squared, plus this term here, which is eta squared g squared. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to divide by 2 eta and also divide by t. Divide by 2 eta and by t, 
And actually, I'll just replace this by capital T because that's the total number of iterations that I'm going to have. And we find that expected value of f at the average, 1 over t times the sum of xt. This is the sum from t equals 1 to capital T minus f of x star. So in other words, on the left-hand side, I have the expected suboptimality evaluated at the average of the trajectory of SGD is upper bounded by exactly what I had before, except I've divided by two eta, by two eta and also divided by t. So this is r squared divided by two eta t plus g squared eta over two. As we've done in previous calculations, this right-hand side is now a convex function of eta. So I can take the derivative, set it equal to 0, evaluate for the best eta. And we can compute that the eta that minimizes the bound on the right-hand side, again, this is just take derivative, set it equal to 0, and solve for eta, is going to be um, equal to r over g times 1 over square root of t. And then plugging this in, we find that this quantity here is upper bounded exactly by what the theorem promised. r g divided by square root of t. So some things that we should, uh, we see is that Again, we get same convergence as a function of t. Same meaning same as in the setting where we had the deterministic case. OK, now let's look at the setting of SGD for strongly convex functions. What happens when f is also strongly convex. And we're going to see here that, again, we get the same, we get, we get the same result. And namely, we're going to get the same convergence rate that we saw in the deterministic case. So this is all good news. So for all the assumptions that we have above, for all as above, in particular, expected value of g tilde squared bounded above by g squared. If in addition, f is strongly convex, note that I'm not assuming that it's smooth. f is alpha strongly convex. It may not be smooth. Then, SGD, but with a particular choice of step size, with a decreasing step size. So with a decreasing step size chosen carefully as eta t equals to 2 over the strong convexity parameter times t plus 1, so basically going down as 1 over t, then a particular averaging of the trajectory gets me convergence rate of the suboptimality at rate 1 over t, so much faster than we saw without strong convexity. So f sum from t equals 1 to t of 2t <coughs> divided by t, t plus 1 times xt. So this is some averaging of xt. It's a, it's, it's a feature of, of how the analysis goes. We're not going to cover all the details here. Minus f of x star is bounded above by 2 g squared over alpha times 1 over t plus 1. So the key feature here is that we get order 1 over t convergence rate. And you can compare this to the 1 over square root of t that we got without, uh, that we got without strong convexity. So what's the summary that we've seen so far? First, we get um, 
the same convergence rate as the deterministic case, which by itself is remarkable. It's saying that if you have an exact, if you, if you, have, a, if you have access to the exact gradient versus if you have access to a noisy gradient in this way, we still get the same convergence rate as a function of t. <clears throat> so for the setting, uh, so this is in the case where expected value of g tilde is bounded. And we get a 1 over square root of t convergence rate. We also have the same convergence rate in the presence of strong convexity. Same convergence rate as the deterministic case when we also have strong convexity. And we get 1 over t. So what is a natural thought if you've been with us since the beginning here. The natural thought is, <clears throat> does this extend to the setting where the function is smooth and strongly convex? So in the deterministic case, in the deterministic setting, if f is smooth and strongly convex, then we saw a much, much faster rate of convergence. We saw a geometric or linear rate of convergence, meaning that there's some constant times t. So all of this means that I need something like 1 over epsilon squared steps to get to uh, error epsilon in the top case. Here I need 1 over epsilon steps to get error uh, epsilon. And here I need log 1 over epsilon steps. So this is remarkably faster. So the question is, can we get anything like this? But looking at the analysis and also looking at the algorithm, we should see that the answer has to be no if we're just using stochastic gradient descent. Let's think back to what was the key to getting, um, to getting this very fast convergence rate. The key to a fast convergence rate was the self-tuning property, which we've already discussed in the context of SGD as well. Our self-tuning property is that the gradient of f of x goes to 0 as x goes to x star. Why was this important? This allows us to take a, what we call the big step size. In particular, if you look back at this choice of eta for everything that we've done today, eta was either decreasing, as in the case of strong convexity, or eta had to be chosen like 1 over square root of t. So that's not a constant. That's something that's, that's, that's going to be very small. So uh, eta is independent of the final error epsilon that we want or the number of steps that we're going to take. And in particular, we took step size eta equal to 1 over the smoothness. Do we have self-tuning for the stochastic case? We don't. So no self-tuning for SGD. What does that mean? Algebraically, this just means that the expected value of gx does not go to 0 as x goes to x star. But we can also just see this much more simply and intuitively through a picture. Through a picture. Let's look at, again, the regression setting. Here are the points. <clears throat> and let's draw the optimal solution. So suppose we are actually at the optimal solution. Now being at the optimal solution means that if I were to take the full gradient, the gradient would be 0. 
But what happens if I take a stochastic gradient? What does a stochastic gradient do? Again, remember that a stochastic gradient is gonna pick one of these points at random and then compute the gradient with respect to that. In other words, it's gonna ask, is this line that we have, is the solution we have optimal for that single point? And of course you can see here that unless I get extremely lucky and I choose one of the points that's exactly on the line, any point that I choose, wherever it is, with overwhelming probability, any point that I choose is going to tell me to move, to shift the line. And if we're taking a very large step size, one that's not linked to T or epsilon, then even if we're at the optimal solution, we're gonna be taking big steps away from it. And that's why we're forced, if we're hoping to get convergence for SGD, as we presented the algorithm, to take a very small step size. Step size that's linked to the number of steps we're ultimately gonna take or the error that we finally want. And that's exactly what does not allow us to have uh, this linear convergence. What we need to do is figure out a way to tame this variance. And this is exactly what we're gonna do next time. And we'll pick it up then.